Welcome back. So activity five, we're going to be system testing and result analysis. So the test plan needs to be followed to some degree. You can obviously go back and make changes. You have 12 hours to do the entire exam. If you think that in activity two, you made a few mistakes or you wanted to add stuff or take stuff out, 100% go back and change what you need to change. So the results need to be recorded. You need to compare against the client brief and the requirements and the time for this should roughly be one and a half hours. So it says follow test and review results. So do what you plan to do for the test section. Seems obvious, right? At the end, I think you should do an overall comparison. That's going to be what the analysis is. You compare what you were asked to do versus what you actually got done. Your final system versus the client brief or requirements. This will show how complete your system is or was based on the requirements. So you need, again, go back and update activity two if you need to. Don't sit there and think, well, I've already done this part. I can't change anything. You can 100% change stuff because it's your exam paper. Um, whatever you have in activity two needs to be copied or moved or pasted into activity five as well, along with some extra information. The test plan needs to be updated. You would have had new ideas of what to test and how to test. Test based on what the client brief and requirements were. So back in activity two, you'd created, um, you read the client brief, you came up with um, requirements, you came up with specifications. That's what you're going to test here. Just make sure everything works as the client wanted it to work and as you decided it should work. How and what to test? Make a list of all the things you were supposed to do. So for example, detect the magnet, keep count of good and bad items. If magnet is detected in this example, turn the green LED on, increment good count. If no magnet, red LED on, beep buzzer, increment bad count. Now, obviously, as you've been watching, I didn't do the stepper motor section. That's something that I think you should probably do if you get a question like this as well. I haven't done that section, but in my other videos, I show how to use a stepper motor. So I'm not going to go back now and add that stuff. Simply make use of a stepper motor or a server motor. Either one should be fine. Because in this case, all you should be able to do or all you should be doing is if something is detected as not having a magnet, for example, maybe just have the stepper motor or the server motor flick left. So it goes into the bin or the garbage bin or to be redone again. If a magnet has been detected, that means that product is fine. It's okay. And what you should do for that one is move it to the right instead. So maybe the magnet, sorry, not the magnet, the stepper motor moves left if it's a bad item and maybe it moves right if it's a good item that's how you could do it next we have fill in the not tablet but table fill in the table so this is an example of my table being filled in i'm going to show you what this looks like in any case but what this is on the left hand side where it says activity two this is the stuff you did from activity two nothing here should be vastly different because whatever you have in activity two should also be here the only new pieces of information you should have here are actual results and comments and justifications. Actual results simply means what actually happened when you tested it. For example, I said in one of mine, test that LEDs can be triggered properly, right? Write a piece of code to simply turn the LEDs on and off. Why? Just to make sure everything works, just to make sure I can control the LEDs from the Raspberry Pi Pico, just to make sure I haven't burnt them out, just to make sure I have the right um, resistors plugged in, so on and so forth. The actual results would be, did the LEDs turn on? Yes or no? If they did not turn on, why did they not turn on? How did you fix it? And uh, comments and justification, I'm just going to stick to justification. Why was this done? Why did I want to test the LEDs? In my case, I'm going to have LEDs as a visual representation of what's going on in, in the system. So I don't want people to have to guess as to whether or not a magnet has been detected on this specific run. So it just made sense to have a green LED would flash or turn on when a magnet has been detected. And if a magnet has not been detected, we'd have the red LED, right? So that's very obvious to most people. Green normally means good or go or okay. Red normally means bad or um, not good. So having those color LEDs just made sense. You don't have to write all of that in that tiny box there, but it's going to be along those lines. So as it says here, be sure to update the table in activity five, but with the activity two information. And again, the activity two information is the test plan. And the test plan is going to be what you intend to test, what you plan to test. 
So in activity two, you don't actually do the test. You simply sit down and think, hmm, what should I actually test when I'm doing my testing? And you come up with your list. In activity five, you give the results of the test. So you actually do the tests in activity five and you give the results. Based on the test, you will fill in the results you actually got. Comment on why this test was done. That's simply going to be the justification as to why the test was done. And finally, we analyze the test results. After doing all the tests, you analyze how many things work versus how many do not work. What were you asked to do versus what you actually got to work in? So let's just say the client had, well, you and the client decided, okay, we're going to make sure these 10 things are operational. These 10 things are okay. Out of the 10 things, how many did you get working? For example, mine, I didn't actually get uh, the text file working not that it didn't work I got a text file I created it and everything but I'm going to leave the text file as not working just so I can have something to speak about as to what didn't work now you sh you should still get marks for stuff that did not work because you've justified why you didn't get it to work one of the things I can say I decided against it because if all the information is being presented to the people using the LEDs, the buzzer, the LCD, and the shell as well. Maybe we don't need a text file as well. It would have been a nice idea, I think. I personally think it would have been a good addition to the system overall, but it wasn't necessary. So spending time doing that when I only have 12 hours might not have made the most sense in the world. Uh, quick note, the exam paper tells you exactly what you have to do for each section. No guesswork is necessary at all, right? So I've had people ask me, sir, what's activity two, what's activity three? Don't worry, the test paper tells you exactly what it is. So let me go to this. These three bullet points here, the last three, one, two, three, these were copied directly from the exam paper. So it says, this is activity five, by the way. It says, test the system using the test plan from activity two and include some unexpected events. Record the outcome of each test in the template provided analyze the test results and evaluate the system for conformance against the client brief. So nothing I'm doing here is stuff I decided to come up with. It was simply on the test paper, on the exam paper, and it told me exactly what to do. So next we have the unexpected events. And some of the ones I could think of straight away off the top of my head are power loss, emergency stop, and a sense of value not being zero or, oh, let me bring my pen up, sorry. Let me just bring my pen up so I can make some notes. So a sense of value not being zero or one, so not being on or off, it's very unlikely that this will ever happen, but just in case it does, we need to plan for it. And we get marks, we get marks on the exam paper for planning for unexpected events. So power loss, let's go and look at power loss. If you lose power, there's not much you can do. Maybe a backup generator in a factory would be fine. In this case, a power bank should be okay because we only need five volts to run the Raspberry Pi Pico and that should run all the components that we have on this circuit here. If you regain power, you can do something. So for the Raspberry Pi Pico specifically, uh, or for Python in general, I'm not sure about other devices, but if you name your file, so that main Python file that you're working in, if you name it main.py, so M-A-I-N dot P-Y, this will run at startup. And what that means is if I run, randomly unplug my Raspberry Pi Pico and I drive a million miles to Timbuktu, right? And I plug my Raspberry Pi Pico into any USB port I find there. All my sensors are still plugged in. Everything is still connected how it was before. What will happen here is that um, the Raspberry Pi Pico will simply start running that main.py program because it's been designed in a way that if you call your program main.py, it will just run that program as soon as it has power. This is how I would plan for the unexpected event, or in this case, to be fair, it's expected, but still, the unexpected event that there is a power loss. So just in case we lose power and we regain power after a few minutes, a few seconds, a few days or whatever, the program will simply start running as soon as the Raspberry Pi gets power again. Next, we have unexpected event emergency stop. I have implemented this. Um, I think I did this the wrong way around. So I have a start button. The start button was actually button left, but it doesn't really matter. And the emergency stop button was button right instead. What this does, go back to the example, we're in a factory, stuff is working fine, but for some reason, um, one of the things, the, the mount bodies get stuck inside the machine and it's just piling up and piling up and piling up and nothing is going through. What I could do, I could run over there, press the emergency stop button, 
clear the pile up, clear the one that was stuck and press the start button again. Another example could be you're in a factory working, someone's hand or shoe or foot or head gets stuck in a machine somewhere. You see it, you go over, you press the stop button. Kind of an unexpected event, but again, as engineers, as designers, as planners, we have to plan, um, design and develop things to accept these random unexpected events because people are stupid, right? Next, we have the sensor error. So that's the unexpected event again. So this has been implemented by me. So if I say if value of the whole sense is equal to zero, do action one, which is to like turn the red LED on, beep the buzzer, so on and so forth. If the value is equal to one, meaning that there is a magnet present, do action two. But what happens if neither of these are ever, ever true? I don't know. I randomly unplug the sensor. Something is being weird. It's not getting any value at all. What I have done, I said else do action three. So it's going to display that there's an error somewhere. We don't care where the error is at this stage. We simply display that there's an error and restart the loop. But the last thing you want is for this to crash because this is not zero or one. So that's why we display the error. We break out of the loop. Well, not break out of it. We simply go back to the very top of the loop. So it will keep checking and keep checking and keep checking forever and ever and ever. So this is another unexpected event if the sensor isn't working properly. What do I have next? Test the unexpected events as well. So unexpected, the word unexpected would indicate that it cannot be tested. This isn't really the case. From the list I gave you, you can test each of these and write down the results. And the list again, I, I only did thought of three things, uh, which was power loss, emergency stop, and um, error in the sensor values. Test each of these. They're relatively easy to test. The way I would test, for example, power loss, I would maybe... Um, randomly unplug my USB port after I've obviously named it main.py. I would randomly unplug the USB port and randomly find another PC. Um, I would maybe go get a power bank and plug the USB port into that as well. And it should just start working. If it does start working, then you know it's, everything is okay. It's good. It's working as it should. If it doesn't work, if it crashes, if, if you don't get any outputs, then you know that there's something wrong. With the emergency stop, same thing. I would simply... Uh, keep pressing the start and stop button back and forth, back and forth. So in your mind, think about this. You're in a factory again, someone's hand gets stuck, you press the stop button, okay, it stops fine. Then you clear the machine, everything is okay. You press the start button, does it start again? Okay, fine. Then someone, another person gets their hand stuck for some reason. You press the stop button again, keep going back and forth for a few seconds just to make sure it's working as it should. And then the next one, a sensor error, I don't know, randomly unplug the sensor, put the, um, what's the thing called again, the magnet closer to it, move it back and forth really, really quickly. It might get some random error because you're moving it so fast. Um, there's nothing much I can, there's not much else I can think of right now. So I'm just going to move on. Uh, where are we next? Top tip. Whenever you analyze something, spelled something wrong. Whenever you analyze something, you should normally evaluate it as well. It does not say this on the exam paper, but I would still do it and I would link it back to the test. So when you're evaluating, you're being critical based on what you know, based on the analysis. So the way I would do this for this specific type of exam, I would say, well, I would ask myself a series of questions. So I would ask the question, is this thing done? So whether it was accomplished or not, I would answer yes or no. And I would briefly explain how it was accomplished. We don't need the why here because the why was the previous section where we justified. So justification simply means why. I would simply do the how here. So explain briefly how this was accomplished. So here I have one. Does the system detect a magnet? The answer is simply yes. So on your exam paper, simply type, sorry, on your Word document, simply type yes. The whole sensor successfully detects whether a magnet is present or not. The value of the whole sensor is zero when no magnet has been detected or when no magnet is present and changes to a one when a magnet is present. So you simply explain how and that's it. Next question is, does the system count the good and bad items? For my system, yes, it does. Both the good and bad items are counted. The count for each one is incremented based on whether a condition is met. If the magnet is present, the good count gets increased by one each time. If a magnet has not been detected, the bad count gets increased by one each time only, I don't know what this is, <laughs> it's supposed to be one, only one count increases at any given time. Meaning, if I have my bad items, um, let's say there's no magnet being detected, 
only the bad count should increase. The good count should stay fixed while the bad count is increasing and vice versa. If I have good items being detected, the good count should increase and the bad count should stay fixed until something happens and it picks up a bad one. Next question, does the system display the number of good and bad items? Yes, for my system it does. The values are displayed to the LCD. Uh, each time there is a change, this is done roughly every second. I believe I put mine to the shell as well. I don't remember quite fair. Um, so if yours is on the shell and on the LCD, simply state that. Does the system buzz at the correct time? For me, I'm going to say yes. If no magnet is detected, the buzzer will buzz once, then go off. I think I say once every second. If the emergency stop button is pressed, the buzzer will beep every 0.3 seconds and the LEDs flash as well. But in this case, we only care about the buzzer for now. So I've said yes to the buzzer and I've stated when it actually does the thing I've claimed it's doing. Now, keep in mind for activity six, you will have to show the system fully working as well in a video. I'm not too sure if you're allowed to edit anything. You definitely have enough time to edit. But if you don't know how to edit, what I would do is just maybe make one long video and do it perfectly uh, next question is does the system save information to a text file i'm going to say no because i didn't do it uh, when i tried to implement this i ran across a number of issues i ran into a number of issues saving the contents of the, the contents of the text file it's, i decided it was best to not do this as the information spelled that wrong as well was already present on the shell and on the lcd now I actually got this working perfectly fine, but I just wanted to say no for something and explain that it's perfectly okay to say no if something doesn't work. Just say why it doesn't work. It could be for a number of reasons. You might not actually know how to do a text file properly and it keeps crashing. You might not think it's necessary. You might think it's taking too long. You might think the text file is going to get really, really, really large after a while. And the Raspberry Pi only has, I believe, two megabytes of um, storage. Whatever reason you've chosen, that's perfectly fine. Next question. Does the system indicate when a batch of 10 is ready? I personally forgot about this. In my case, it's going to be a no. This is relatively easy to do and I'm going to explain how it's done. This is an easy thing to implement. So at this stage, I will simply go back and fix this. So hint for anyone looking how to do this or trying to figure this out, you need to look into modulus division or remainder division in Python. And the way this works, it simply says, if there is a remainder, then do whatever. So for example, let's just say I get to 50 items, right? If I modulously or modulus divide this by 10, so batches of 10 is what I'm checking for, the answer is going to be 5 and the remainder is going to be equal to 0, which means that there's no remainder when I divide by 10, telling me for a fact, 100% sure, that the, this, this is a batch of 10. Now, let's just say I got to 51 and I do 51 modulus 10 if you guys go back and watch my Python tutorial videos, I believe I went over modulus division or remainder division as well. So please have a look at that. If I divide 51 modulus 10, the answer is still going to be 5. But in this case, the remainder is going to be 1. Now, this tells me for a fact that it's not in batches. Of, is, this is not a batch of 10 yet because there is a remainder. If there is a remainder, if the remainder is not equal to zero, this is not a batch of 10. So in my if statement, I could simply do if good count equals, um, sorry, if good count div, uh, modulus divide by 10 equals five with no remainder, it's a batch of 10, well done. If there is a remainder, it's not a batch of 10 and just ignore it, right? That's how that would be done. Next question, does the system push the good items to one side and the bad items to the other? I'm going to say no because I did not incorporate the motor here. Again, I have a video on my Raspberry Pi Pico tutorial. And if you go and watch that one, you'll see how to use both the servo motor and the stepper motor. I would personally use a stepper motor because it's very easy to use and it can be more precise if you need it to be. Uh, what I would do is I would simply say if it's a bad item. So let's just say in my if statement I had in my program, if bad item, then I would simply rotate the stepper motor and let it go left. And if it's a good item, rotate the stepper motor and let it go right. That's all I would need to do. That's it. Done. Uh, no more questions. Okay. So that's what I, this is what I'm going to do for my activity five. I'm not going to make my activity five uh, Word document video very long. So that's what's going to come next. Simply going to show you a few tests and how I filled in a few examples. That's it.